So yeah, starting seeds indoors under lights. Um, every year I get lots of questions about it. There's lots of people who want to start their own plants. Um, you know, and, and there's different ways to do that. Some people think they want to get a greenhouse or some people think I'm just going to start them indoors in the window. And then the third option, of course, is starting them indoors under lights. In the window just does not work very well. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it. I've had some people be successful, but most people I know who try growing plants indoors seeds in the window aren't successful. Um, the light just isn't strong enough and the plants are always leaning towards the light and they're usually real thin and spindly and just not very healthy plants. And then with the greenhouse, it sounds pretty easy. You know, all you have to do is build some kind of a frame, put up some plastic and you've got a greenhouse. But unfortunately that's not really enough to grow um, successfully. You need um, heat in that greenhouse and that's problematic. You have to figure out some kind of heating source that will maintain it to be at least 55, 60 degrees at night. And then the other question is when the sun comes out during the day, it's going to get way too hot in there. You need some kind of fans and vents, windows that open up. So it's a lot of work to actually run a greenhouse and a home greenhouse is not an easy thing to do. So the easiest way to grow your own plants and get a fair amount of plants is to start them indoors under lights. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, you know, the reasons, you know, are, might seem kind of obvious and obviously you've got your own reasons if you're here wanting to learn about it, but you know, you can save a lot of money if you grow your own plants. Um, you know, buying plants, even if you buy them at the Kansas City Community Gardens, where our plant prices are very reasonable, um, you know, it can be very expensive if you want to have a lot of plants. The other advantage to growing your own is you can pick your own varieties. I mean, nurseries and greenhouses try to grow lots of different kinds, um, you know, lots of heirloom varieties these days. There's so many varieties available, but they can't grow very many. Um, if you want something interesting and unusual that nobody else has or nobody in your neighborhood has, you know, you see them in the catalogs, there's all these really cool varieties, you want to try them, your best bet is to grow them indoors under lights. And then, you know, thirdly, just enjoyment, you know, a lot of people get satisfaction out of starting their own plants. And, you know, if you've been cooped up all winter, like most of us have, and it's not over yet, you know, it's not really gardening time yet. It felt like it today outside, but we're going to get supposedly seven inches of snow and five degrees here later this week. So while we're waiting, you know, you can start some of your own plants indoors. So that's always kind of exciting. All right. So, so many varieties. I mean, I think just about in peppers and tomato varieties alone, you know, there are hundreds, if not thousands of different varieties. And Again, it's just kind of fun to try some of each, a few of each, try something unusual. Um, you like a particular kind of pepper. Um, so, you know, your favorite place doesn't have it for sale. You can start it yourself by ordering the seeds and growing them indoors under lights. There are a few common mistakes just to kind of warn you about. And um, if you can avoid these common mistakes, you'll be miles ahead in growing your own plants indoors successfully. Um, of course, the first one is growing in the window as opposed to using lights. But then also um, not growing close enough to the lights. You know, how close are your plant seedlings as they're sprouting? How close do you want them to the lights is a question we'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, also, it's a mistake to start your plants too early. You think if you start early, you'll get a really giant plant and you'll have tomatoes, you know, two months early, but it's just hard to grow a big plant indoors under lights. Um, it just doesn't work very well. So you're really better off trying to grow a small transplant size, just like you would normally buy from a greenhouse. Um, you know, something that comes in a six pack or a four pack, and that's a good size for transplanting and moving outside. The other mistake that people make, um, is just starting the wrong kinds of plants. Not every plant is a good candidate for transplanting. The root systems don't lend themselves well to that. Um, so um, different things like tomatoes, peppers, they, they transplant pretty well. We'll talk about this a little bit later, which ones are the best and which ones are really not a good idea for, for transplanting. 
All right, so think about timing and planting. Um, you know, again, that common mistake that I mentioned in the last slide, people starting too early. Um, what happens is your plants get root bound inside their little containers. They don't transplant very well. Um, so most vegetable plants indoors and their lights are gonna take somewhere between four and nine weeks. Um, and that gets you a pretty good sized plant. Um, there's some like, I mean, peppers take a little bit longer. Um, things like lettuce don't take quite as long. And, um, you know, indoors under life, it's gonna take a little bit longer than in a greenhouse situation. Uh, sometimes you'll hear in a catalog, it'll tell you like, you know, start six weeks before, you know, frost or planting time or whatever. And then, but that's assuming maybe you're in a greenhouse. So it might take a little bit longer. And so as you do this and you try it from year to year, make notes for yourself, you'll get a, a sense of how long is the, just the right amount of time. There's a few plants and there are some of the ones that we don't normally recommend for starting indoors under lights um, that don't take very long. And if you do them in a special container, um, you can do that. And so I think of things like cucumbers, squash, melons, um, if you're going to start those indoors under lights, you're going to need to use a special kind of container, which we'll talk about, but also just not grow them very long. You're really just kind of giving them maybe a two week head start. Uh, you don't want to try and start them six weeks, eight weeks earlier. The vines are going to be all stretched out. Um, the root systems will not be uh, in good shape for transplanting later. So I, I recommend uh, to people, um, starting you count backwards from the number of weeks required from the proper planting date for that specific vegetable. Um, so think like tomato plants, you know, um, if you're gonna plant them around May 1st or May 10th, count back maybe four or five weeks, maybe six weeks, and that will be the date you're gonna plant indoors. All right, let's talk a little bit about equipment and supplies. Um, obviously, you're gonna need some kind of a grow light unit. Um, I do recommend having a timer that you can plug that into just so you can have it turn off and on at the same time every day. You're gonna need some kind of growing containers, uh, something like a cell pack or a plug flat or jiffy pellets or something. And then some kind of potting mix. Um, and generally, when we say potting mix, it's what they call a soilless mix, meaning it doesn't actually have real dirt in it. Uh, it's something that's usually peat moss based. Some of them are like pine bark based. I, I'm kind of a fan of the peat bark based ones. Um, the Pro Mix is one that we use here at Kansas City Community Gardens. It's a really good growing mix and you can buy it at garden centers. Of course, you'll need whatever seeds that you're gonna plant. Um, so if you haven't got those, you need to order them soon. Generally, you want to order your seeds from a mail order catalog. Um, you can just walk in to a garden center and buy some, but your selection is going to be much more limited. If you want to have the best choice of especially really interesting varieties, go to a, a mail order catalog and order some seeds from them. And then you're going to need some plastic bags, uh, which we'll talk about later, and maybe or some flat covers, something to cover up your flats that you're starting your seeds in just to keep them moist. A spray bottle is nice so you can mist the top of the soil. A small watering can so you can water them. Um, I like to have a shallow tub for watering uh, just because trying to water indoors, you know, water leaks out all over and it can make a mess. So it'd be much better off if you have it some kind of a tub. And then um, it's always good to have some marking stakes or labels, we call them, plastic labels. You can get blank ones. You can make them out of popsicle sticks or something if you want. Um, and then a felt tip marker, Sharpies work good, of course, so you can label them. And then um, sometimes it's helpful to have a heating pad um, just to give you a little bit warmer temperatures right at the root zone. Uh, will give you faster germination and faster growth. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. All right, so the grow light unit is probably the biggest investment. And there are just all kinds of grow light units. You can build your own, you can buy them. Um, they're kind of expensive if you buy them. But 
regardless, the kind that you, if you're going to buy one or if you're going to build one, you want to make sure that it's going to be adequate, it's going to have enough light, and it's going to be big enough for what you want to do. Um, I can tell you right off the bat, looking at these right here, it's just a single light fixture, this one here. This is like a single light fixture here that's over a group of, of three flats of plants. That's not going to be enough light. Uh, you're going to want multiple light fixtures in there. Um, let's look at this next slide. Um, here's some more homemade ones. Um, you can have them multi-level if you, if you really need it. Again, that's a single light fixture there. Even though it has a wide reflector, which is good, um, it's going to give you kind of a narrow growing area. Um, this one here is one that I saw that somebody built, and it's kind of fancy the way the stand is made. You don't have to build it that fancy. Um, you could build it just like this one down here, it basically make sort of a wooden frame uh, with box. But what I like about this one up here is the size. It's based, This is a basic bedding plant flat. Um, it's called the 1020 flat. Basically, it's just a little bit under 12 inches by 24 inches. It's actually about 11 by 21 or 22. Um, but so think of like though, still it's about one foot wide and two feet long. So what that means is in this growing unit, which you have four of them, it's gonna be four feet long and two feet wide. And so think of that two by four space. It gives you a nice growing space. You can grow a lot of plants in a two by four foot space. You could easily grow uh, 250 plants. If you want to, you can grow more than that, depending on the size containers you use. Um, but then the thing is, you're going to need enough light for this. A single light unit will not be enough. Um, uh, let me see. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that picture in a little bit. Um, if you buy a store-bought unit, they can be very expensive. Um, this is one that's just in a gardening catalog I saw. It's $359 um, for this grow light unit. And often the lighting is not adequate. This, this still probably only has, you know, two bulbs in it. Um, you need at least four and, and six would be better um, for this kind of space that you have here. Um, so I'm not a big fan of buying them. Um, I mean, you can buy the fixtures and just build the wooden frame. So um, if you go back to this one here, again, it's pretty simple just to, you know, cut up some lumber. You can use two by fours or one by fours. You can use two by twos um, and just make a wooden frame, but make it four feet long and two feet wide. And then generally I would probably make it at least two feet high, um, maybe three feet high just to give you some space. Um, so those are good dimensions. And when you're buying fixtures, um, you know, the grow light bulbs have come a long, long way. Um, the, the old fluorescent lights that they used to have, um, I don't even know if you can actually get those. You can still get real fluorescent lights, uh, but they're more compact. They're not as big a diameter bulb as they were. Uh, this one on the left here is called the T5. It's a compact fluorescent. Um, and so, Again, this is 48 inches long. That's the size I recommend. It's what they call a shop light. Um, it's like you might have out in your garage, over your workshop, over your workbench. So um, it's a nice size for growing plants. And then of course they come with different sizes of bulbs. Um, these, uh, oops, sorry. So different, different kinds of bulbs, the old fluorescent bulbs, not the real old ones, but the more modern, what they call compact fluorescence, uh, T5. And what you're looking for is if it designates the type is cool, cool light. Um, and then the other option would be LEDs. Of course, LEDs are very popular now, and they now make those in the same configuration, these long tube type bulbs uh, for 48 inches long. And you can get LEDs in different lengths, um, but the, the 48 inch long just works really nice to make that nice two by four foot square um, growing area. Um, so the fixtures, these are just from the Home Depot prices um, for the, the regular fluorescent. They were $26 for that 
fixture that holds two bulbs. The LED one was like about twice that much. Um, so obviously more expensive and the LED bulbs are more expensive, but they do last longer. Um, but if you're trying to get in for as cheaply as possible, I would still recommend the, the fluorescent bulb. Um, so what I recommend to you when you go to buy these is that you buy three of these units, regardless of which kind you want. So it's going to be three units with two bulbs each. And then you're going to hook that into a wooden frame that's going to hold four flats like that. So that's what it's going to look like. All right, let's talk about containers and soil mix, which is also called growing medium. Um, the growing medium that I do recommend is called Pro Mix. Uh, it's a peat moss based one. What I like about the Pro Mix is that you can get different formulations of it. And some of them actually have microorganisms added in um, that will help you know, plants grow healthier. These are things that would occur naturally in nature uh, that will just help help your plants grow better and faster. So anyhow, a lot of growers use these kind of mixes now. Um, and the other nice thing about the Pro Mix is it's sterile, meaning that you're not going to have a lot of harmful bacteria in there. Um, so you're not going to get like damping off fungus and things like that. So it's also very lightweight. Um, when it comes in, it's pretty dry, so you have to moisten it, and then you fill up your containers and plant your seeds, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Containers come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, looking here at these containers right here, um, whoops. So these are, the ones on the left are what you would call um, cell packs or inserts. Actually, let me see if I got another slide here, yeah. Okay, um, so like the ones on the left are like a six pack and there's like um, 10 six packs in there. So that would give you 60 plants in that um, flat, that 1020 basic bedding plant flat that I'm talking about. The thing on the right is actually called a plug flat. And that's what a lot of growers use to start a lot of little plants. And then they'll transplant them into bigger containers, either like a two inch pot or a you know, or to the cell packs on the left there. Um, but in that one there, that's a 288 plug flat. A lot of plug flats are 200s, meaning you get 200 or 288 little plants. So you can grow a lot of plants in there. They just can't grow very big before they outgrow their space. But if you're looking for quantity, um, that plug flat is a good thing to do. If you're looking for quality, because you have a bigger root mass, the one on the left, the, the cell packs, um, are better. And so the question is, where do you buy these things? Um, you can buy them from garden centers. Um, some of them will sell them individually. Like I know if you go to Planter Seed downtown in the River Market, you can buy just empty flats, the 1020 flats, and then you can buy individual sheets of the cell packs, all different shapes and configurations. Um, you can buy a plug flat like that. And the other container, there's some little pots too that you could buy things like that and put them in the flat if you want. Um, you can also buy what's known as a jiffy pellet. And we'll talk about jiffy pellets here in a little bit. So again, here's the different, different types. Um, you can see that how the sizes are different. The cell packs um, you know, are kind of a, a medium size. The plug flats are very tiny little root systems. But if you're, again, trying to get quantity, you can grow a lot. The Jiffy Pellet is a very interesting growing container. I didn't used to think too much of them, but now I am a huge fan of Jiffy Pellets. And that's what I use at home for starting plants. What I like about them is that you don't get the roots all bound up once they keep growing inside the container. Inside, inside this container, the roots, you know, they're going to twist around in circles and get root bound. You know, when you pull one of these out, um, the roots are going to be very tangled. And I usually recommend that people loosen them up and actually cut them with the scissors and trim them and loosen them up so that the roots will grow out into the ground. If you don't do that, um, the plants don't take off very well. 
Um, and the same is true in the plug plant, in fact, even more so because that's a very tiny little growing area and they get root bound very quickly. So you don't want to leave them in there too long. But in the Jiffy pellet, basically what it is, it's a bunch of compressed potting soil, mostly peat moss with a little bit of nutrients, a um, little bit of uh, vermiculite in there. Um, and then it has this little plastic netting around it. So you can see what it looks like when it starts out. It looks like a little flat uh, disc. And then you set them in water. And in about five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, they expand because all that peat moss in there, which has been compressed, starts expanding when the moisture gets there. And so then it turns into a container, a uh, little thing here about this size. Uh, sometimes it almost looks like a brownie or something or a little, little cupcake or something. And there's usually a little hole in the center where you can drop the seed. And you drop the seed in there and you can sprinkle a little potting soil on top of that. And then as it grows, the roots, instead of twisting around in circles and getting all root bound, the roots actually grow to the edge and start to come out um, through the netting. And once they hit the air, uh, they generally stop growing unless they're packed closely together. But the point is you don't get that root bound. So the roots just take off much quicker. You have a really healthy root system. Now the plants may not get as tall um, as, as they do in uh, a cell pack, but that's okay because you're more concerned about that root system. You want a healthy, healthy root system. Uh, you can buy these at planters. You can buy them online at Amazon, uh, different places. They do make some that are made out of a different material that are made out of like a coconut hull that's been shredded. And I have not had good luck with those. Uh, I've had the best luck with the ones that are made out of peat moss. So that's what I would recommend to you. And if you buy them in big bulk, like 100 at a time or 1,000 at a time, they're like 10 to 15 cents each. So lots of times when you're starting your own plants, you'll see in the catalogs kits you know, that try and get you everything all at once. So you don't have to figure this out. And I understand that they're trying to make it simple for you, but usually um, they're kind of gimmicky and they're usually overpriced. Um, and sometimes they have things in there that you don't really need. Here's an example of a kit. It's called a all-in-one APS seed starting kit. So it sounds really fancy. Basically it's two trays. Um, they're not very good size um, trays. That, Plants are a little bigger than you need. If you're not growing very many plants, that would be okay. If you're trying to grow more. Um, but again, they're gonna be very expensive. You know, they've got some little labels, you got a little bit of fertilizer, um, comes with a plastic cover, um, you know, a little bit of potting soil. Um, and then it has a, a water level indicator. Because this one in particular, a lot of times these kits, they have self-watering things. They soak up water from below they sit in a tray and I am not a big fan of self-watering um, trays because they tend to just stay wet all the time um, and that's okay when the seeds are sprouting but if plants grow they need to start to go through drying out and then you water them and then they start to dry out and then you water them they should not just stay soggy all the time um, because roots do not like to grow well in those soggy situations here's an example of another one Again, this is just a, a plastic bedding plant tray with a few pellets in it, a little bit of fertilizer, a little plastic cover over the top, and it's 40 bucks. That should probably cost you about five or six bucks. You know, if you put all the materials together, maybe seven bucks max. Um, the other thing is when they put this little plastic dome over it, it looks like a little greenhouse, you know, the mini greenhouse, somehow, people think that's going to make it grow really good indoors, like somehow that's going to provide more light. It doesn't. It helps hold in the humidity, but it doesn't help with the light. You still have to get light. So it needs to, the plants need to be under the lights. And what I don't like about this one is it's too tall. If you have that over the top, you're not going to be able to get your lights close enough to where um, the plants can get enough light. So not a big fan of seed starting kits. I do not recommend them. I just recommend going to down to a place like planter seed and getting the materials. It's kind of like ordering a la carte and just get what you need and the right sizes. Get some pro mix. Um, you can buy pro mix in a big bale or you can buy it in a small to medium sized bag. If you buy the big bale of pro mix, it will last you a long, long time. 
fairly expensive, like 30, 35 bucks. Uh, you can get smaller bags that are cheaper, uh, but that big bale will last you forever almost. So, all right, let's talk about planting the seeds and selection. Um, assuming you have varieties, let's talk about which plants work the best for starting indoors for growing in containers. This list here is kind of a short list of the ones that work the best, kind of your average garden plants, tomatoes and peppers, of course, but also eggplants. Uh, some of the cool season vegetables like lettuce, broccoli, cabbage, etc. Herbs work great if you're trying to start them indoors under lights. Um, perennial flowers, um, annual flowers. Um, just to give you an idea of what your cost savings might be like, let's say you were going to start, you want to get 100 coneflower plants, the popular um, perennial flower, the native plant. You know, if you bought 100 of them, probably the cheapest you'd find them is for four or five bucks each. Um, so if you bought 100 of them, that would be $500. If you started your own indoors under lights and you started 100 of them, you might spend five dollars. Um, so if you want a lot of something, um, starting them indoors under lights, especially if you use plug flats or smaller um, of the cell packs, you can get a lot of plants in small space. If you like lots of flowers around your patio or whatever um, for growing for cut flowers, um, or if you're trying to grow a lot of tomatoes and sell tomatoes, uh, it might be worth your while growing your own plants. Um, so those are the plants that work right, work well, all those different ones, because their root systems are well suited to transplanting. Um, here's the ones that don't work so great. And it doesn't mean you can't do it, but generally they do not work good, especially in cell packs, uh, because the root systems get root bound real easy. Um, so think of things, especially root crops, things like carrots, turnips, and radishes. And that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just doesn't work very well. I even saw a website where a guy said, yes, you can grow carrots indoors, start them indoors under lights. And he was had a big long article about it, but somewhere in the article he says, but it doesn't really work very well. You know, uh, you're much better off just planting carrots out in the ground. But also things like beans and peas, their root systems do not like to be transplanted. Uh, once they get root bound, it stunts their growth. The same is also especially true of um, Vining plants, things like cantaloupes, cucumbers, watermelons, squash, pumpkins. Um, one of my very first things I, I grew indoors under lights, uh, my dad, you know, we were starting a garden. And we thought, gosh, we're going to start our pumpkin plant indoors so we can get a big start on it so we can grow the giant, you know, 300 pound pumpkin, you know. It was a great idea. I was about 14. Uh, we started a pumpkin plant in January. And it got big, so we put it in a bigger pot, and then it got bigger, so we put it in a bigger pot. And then when we transplanted it outside, um, the roots were all bound up, they were root bound. So it did not transplant well, and it eventually died. Um, but even things like um, okra, if you plant okra in cell packs, um, they're gonna get root bound. And if you plant okra in the ground outside and you plant some from a plant that was grown indoors in the cell pack, the one that you plant outside in the, with a seed will grow faster than the one that came in the cell pack. And the same thing is true of things like, you know, zucchini, um, other squash, cantaloupes, melons, etc. So that's why I do not recommend growing those vine crops. In fact, all of these, if you really, really want to try them, what I recommend to you is you use a jiffy pellet so you don't get that root bound thing happening, especially. Um, you know, with melons, cucumbers, you want to get early start your cucumbers or watermelons, great. Use a jiffy pellet, plant it about two weeks early, um, let's say maybe the middle of April, um, and then transplant it. If you want to do early corn, get early sweet corn, fine, or okra, but use jiffy pellets for those kinds of things because they just do not have root systems that are well suited to transplanting. All right, let's talk about actually planting the seeds. Um, you know, indoors you have much better control. It's not gonna, you're not gonna get a big downpour. It's gonna wash all your seeds away. Um, it's not gonna go freezing cold on you. So indoors, uh, the thing for germination is you need a moist environment and that's constant. You don't want them to dry out and you need warm temperatures, constant. 
So you want to have your potting soil moistened. Um, you want to have nice temperatures. Um, I would say at least 70 degrees. If you're trying to hurry things along and, you know, especially warm season stuff, you're trying to grow some peppers like a habanero pepper. They like it really warm. Um, you might have 85 degrees. It's hard to get 85 degrees in your house, but you can do that with a heating pad um, to make it warmer. But if it's cold in your house and it goes down, temperatures drop, you know, down to 60 or 65 at night because you're trying to save energy. Or if you're doing this in your basement, your basement is kind of cool. Um, the warm temperatures are needed to help get your seeds to germinate. If it's, you know, 60 degrees, it's going to be very, very slow to germinate down in your basement or wherever. So you want to make it warm enough. So in order to get prepared for planting your seeds, you're going to moisten that growing mix, uh, the potting soil, the pro mix, whatever you're using. And what I do with that, it's very dry when you get it. I like to put it in a big plastic tub and put it in that plastic tub and then uh, moisten it with some warm water and then kind of fluff it up. You don't want it soggy, but you want it, you want it to be fairly moist. So then you fill up your containers and kind of level them off. I'll take like a ruler or something just to kind of level them off. And then lots of times I'll make little tiny holes like with the end of a pencil eraser just to drop the seeds in. Um, the other thing that's nice about growing with the potting mix, it's a little more forgiving if you plant too deep. Outside in, in a heavy soil mix and you plant too deep, your seeds may not sprout because they're going to have a hard time pushing up to the heavy soil. The potting mix is lighter. So if you're planting little, little tiny seeds, you still don't want to plant them very deep, but you can cover them up with a little bit of the potting soil and, and then they still will burst through even though um, it's maybe a little too deep accidentally. Um, you also wanna make labels, um, write down your variety name because at some point when your tomatoes start sprouting, you've got six different kinds. You wanna make sure you know which ones are which so that you can compare them when you plant them out in your garden, see which ones you like. Um, so I put down the, the variety name, but I also put down the, the date that you sowed that. So you know how many days it took you you know, until you're ready to plant it outside. Also just to help you know what, how long maybe to wait until those seeds sprout. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the actual sowing methods. Um, so in the olden times, they say olden times, maybe 30 years ago, people used to plant seeds in just directly in the seed flat and then they would dig it out and transplant it and put it in the cell pack. But now people are more often just doing direct sow. You're filling up those cell packs, I think with four or six in the cell pack. And then um, you're gonna direct sow so you don't have to dig them out and transplant. But the question is how many seeds are you gonna put in each cell of that cell pack? And generally, um, if it's a really expensive seed, I might just Okay, great. Our recording is back going again. Um, so one thing that I do to um, make it easier for sowing um, little tiny seeds is I'll take like a little index card and I'll fold it in half and trim it a little bit. So basically it makes kind of a long um, little sort of a funnel to put the seeds in. I'll sprinkle the seeds in there and then I can kind of, I'll take like a paper clip or a pin and I can slide those seeds off one by one if they're really tight. Um, if you want to see more what that look like, uh, you can send me an email and I'll, I'll send you a picture that I didn't have one here today. But if you have really tiny seeds, it just makes it very easy to have a little uh, index card to help hold the seeds just so you don't drop them in one by one. You can do it one by one, uh, but with the tiniest seeds, it gets kind of hard. 
you're going to drop the seeds or if it's doing two seeds or three seeds in the center of the cell and then you're going to drop a little about actually first i like to moisten that while the seeds are uncovered just to make sure that they get moistened so you take your mister bottle and your, your soil is already moist, but now you're going to mist on top of that so those seeds actually get some moisture right on top of that. And then you're going to cover those seeds lightly with a little bit of dry potting soil. Just, you know, kind of pinch it between your finger, almost like if you were sprinkling um, <clears throat> something like when you're cooking. And just enough to barely cover the seeds. And then you're going to mist it again now that they're covered. And then what I like to do after that is cover them uh, that flat, either there's like a clear plastic container, like a little greenhouse cover. Um, they sell those at Planter Seeds downtown too. Um, they're only about two inches tall, but they fit right over a flat. Um, or you could put a plastic bag over your flat. Um, if you buy like a kitchen trash bag, the, the white trash bags that usually fit over them pretty nice. The thing is, it's hard to see what's going on inside. So you have to keep looking at it to make sure you know when the seeds are sprouting. So you want to cover it up so they don't dry out too quickly. And so then the actual germinating, again, you've got them covered with that flat cover or a plastic bag, and they're going to be in a warm place, but not in direct sun. Don't try to stick them in the window, um, thinking that they'll get you know, more light and warm up better. It can get too hot inside there. Um, so it is helpful. I like to do it under the lights because in general, most seeds actually benefit, even though you cover them, they benefit from having light over them. Um, so just put them over the flats. Um, if it's cold in your basement or your house or wherever you have, or you turn the temperature down at night, you can get a heating pad <coughs> um, underneath it. That'll help the seeds to germinate sprouter quicker. And um, I recommend checking the seeds twice a day to see if they sprouted. And you'll see them poking their heads up. If you look at this picture here, these seeds are pretty large, but with this, you'll get the same thing with smaller seeds. It looks like a little crook neck like this, almost like a candy cane. Um, and that's as the seed is getting ready to lift up the, the seed there. Um, and you'll just see little tiny bits of green start happening. And once you see them, even though there's no leaves, at that point, if you haven't already, you want to get them moved under the lights and you want to get the lights up close so that they will start getting enough light so they won't stretch out. Um, and now this is probably one of the most important things I want you to learn today is how to manage the lighting. Um, you need to keep the lights close to the plant leaves. And I usually say about one inch. And that's going to require some adjustment on your part because as the plants grow, um, they'll get a little bit taller. They'll be going to get too close to the lights. It's okay if they're a little bit closer. It's even okay if they touch the lights a little bit. Uh, that's not a good thing long term, uh, but they aren't really hot bulbs. Um, but as far as just growing the best, it's better if they're not actually touching the lights. Um, so you're going to need to um, have them close. Here you can see the light fixture up above. Um, the plants are very close to the lights, like about one inch from the top of the leaf to where the lights are. And as far as how long, um, it's interesting. They've done different experiments. It's actually not good for plants to get lights 24 hour a day. Plants actually need to have rest, to have dark. Uh, so usually think about eight hours of darkness, about 16 hours of light. Some people say 12 hours of darkness, 12 hours of light. It's, it's not a big difference either way, um, but you definitely want to keep them on more than they're off. So um, some people will have a timer so you can set it to come on at the same time every day and turn off at the same time every night. Um, if you don't have a timer, what I tell people is just turn the lights on first thing in the morning when you wake up and turn them off when you're going to bed. Hopefully you're getting about eight hours of sleep and that will work out about right. So bad lighting management is what happens when you aren't close enough to the lights. Um, you can see here in this picture, you know, this was the one we saw in the catalog. Look how far 
these are from the lights. Those are probably about four inches, and these are the taller plants. These lower plants here are probably about six, eight inches from the light. They're going to stretch out. Um, and so here's what happens lots of times. The picture on the right, I get people say, this is what my seedlings look like. And sometimes they'll show me a picture or they'll bring them in and show them to me. This is what happens is when plants don't get enough light right away. So either that means that um, they waited too long to put them under the lights. Um, and this even happens with us sometimes here at community gardens, if we don't get them out, we start the plants indoors, we put them in our conference room where it's warm, and then we take them out to the greenhouse as soon as they sprout. We don't get them out to the greenhouse where there's good light quick enough, they start stretching out. Um, that's what this is called. You see how, you know, the leaves are way up on top. They're very skinny. After a while, they'll fall over. So that means either you did not get them out quick enough um, or under the lights quick enough, or you didn't get them close enough to the lights to where they're getting enough light so they're not stretching out. So this is just basically plants trying their best to get as close to the lights, but they're going to be weak stalks. The stems are going to be very weak. Um, and they'll fall over. Um, they just don't grow well. They're not sturdy plants. Um, so that's what you want to avoid. If that happens, I usually recommend people just start over and get them closer to the lights. I can tell you pretty much probably all these in this picture on the left, those were, plants were probably all grown in a greenhouse um, because if they had them that far away from the lights, they did not look that good. So um, you want to make sure you get them close enough to the lights. And then you're going to continually need to adjust. Um, let me see if I got a good picture here. So back to this. Um, when the plants get taller, you can raise up the lights up higher. Um, in fact, if we go back to what the lights look like here, um, you can see this light unit here has a chain. And so you can have that fastened to the wooden frame up above. And then you can take it up a couple notches as your plants get taller. Um, that's one way to do it, is to raise the lights as the plants get taller. The other way to do it is to start out um, having your plants maybe sitting on some boards underneath the flats. Um, you could have some boards underneath, maybe two or three, uh, three quarter inch boards. And then as the plants grow and start to get taller, you'll pull out um, you know, one of the boards and then that will bring the plants down lower so they're not getting too crowded up against the lights. There's just different ways you can do that. All right, let's talk about temperature management a little bit. Um, you know, you gotta figure out where you're gonna grow the plants in your house. Obviously you have to have enough room. A lot of people will do it like in a spare bedroom, uh, family room, a basement. Your garage is probably not the best place because it's usually pretty cold in the garage. Uh, basement, depending on your heat situation, um, could work pretty well. If it's too cool in the basement or too cool in your spare bedroom, you probably will need some heating pad. Um, I really recommend you invest in a thermometer. And I like having a minimum maximum thermometer. What that is, that's something that records the hottest that it got during the day and the coldest it got during the night. And this is actually something useful just to have um, for outside. Um, but you can use it indoors just to find out how your temperatures are doing, you know, wherever you have your growing unit. So um, there's two different kinds of thermometers. This is kind of the old school one here. It's a minimum maximum. So what it does is on this side, it shows what the, the lowest it went was. On this side here, it'll show the highest it went to. And then you reset that every day. Usually it's like you press this red button and that sets it back to whatever the ambient temperature is. Um, this is a digital one. This is probably easier to find. You can buy them on Amazon or um, order them from other mail order sources. Um, and again, it's got a little button. That you press the button, it'll show you what the hottest would be. Like the hottest on this day, it was 77.9 degrees. Then you press the button again, and it'll show you how cold it got last night. It got down to 50 degrees or 60 degrees. It's also kind of nice. Um, you can have it set up to show the date. Uh, you can have it show the humidity. Um, so they're very useful. Good one costs probably 25 
maybe 30 bucks, um, but it's a really useful gardening tool to have. But what you're aiming for in your growing area is uh, for your warm season plants. So think of things like peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, um, cucumber, something like that, or herbs like uh, basil. They like it warm. So during the day, you're going to want to get to about 75 degrees. And these are ideal. You know, if it doesn't work out and you only get to 70, that's not too bad. It's just going to grow a little bit slower. Um, warm season plants at night, they like it at least 65. 65 to 70 is good. And, you know, again, if your house is, is too cool for that, it just means your plants will grow slower. Um, if you want to, you can get that heating pad put underneath. But plants do really like this uh, temperature um, differential where basically, because this is what happens in nature, it gets warmer during the day and it cools off a little bit at night. Um, and if you're doing cool season plants, things like broccoli, cabbage, um, collard greens, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, or lettuces, things like that. Again, um, you know, 65 to 70 during the day, but 50 to 55 at night is a good temperature. We want it a little bit cooler at night. If, if it's too warm for the cool season plants at night, they tend to stretch out, get kind of leggy and thin. And for the warm season plants, if it's too cool at night, they just don't grow very fast. So. These are what you're aiming for. If your house is 70 all the time, that's really not too bad and your plants will still be pretty fine. This is just kind of the ideal temperatures. All right, let's talk about when your plants are sprouted, they're growing under the lights. Um, you know, you've got to continue to take care of them. So you're going to be watering them, fertilizing them. Um, so you want to water them when the mix starts to dry out. Uh, it'll start to get lighter in color. It'll, peat moss, when it's, when it's wet, it's dark brown. When it's dry, it's light brown. <coughs> It'll be really obvious. I do recommend using lukewarm uh, or room temperature water, water that's been sitting out, um, or even slightly warm, like 70, 75 degree water is fine. That's not such a shock to the root system. If you take cold water right out of the tap in the winter, it's going to be about 35 degrees, and your tomato plants are not going to be happy. Uh, they're going to think that um, the winter is coming back and they're going to slow down and not grow very fast. Um, so like you want to water enough to where a little bit of water comes out the bottom of the cell pack. That's why you want to buy flats that do have holes in them. Sometimes you will see flats that don't have holes in them, and I do not recommend that just because they're just going to hold water in them. Um, so and same thing, if you use some kind of a little pot, it needs to have a hole in the bottom. Um, so just water enough till a little bit comes out the bottom. Um, use a gentle stream, a nice small little watering can is good. Um, the mister by itself is really not enough to water the plant if it gets dry. It'll just take you too long and you won't get it thoroughly moist. Um, the mister is really just for keeping the, the soil top uh, moist when you're trying to sprout the seeds. Once you actually start watering, uh, a gentle little watering can. And I'm not a big fan of watering from underneath. Some people like doing that. It's less messy. Um, they'll just set it in a tray of water, let it soak up water, and that works okay. Um, but you don't want to leave it sitting in water, again, because plants do not like to be constantly wet. They need to go through a drying out period. Not that you want them to get totally dry, but starting to dry out is what you're looking for. Another part of growing on is thinning out the seedlings. If you put two or three each little cell, you need to thin them out. So here's some tomato seedlings. Picture's a little bit out of focus, but you can see some of them have one plant growing in them. Some of them have two. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to pull out one of those. And um, this thinning it's always hard for gardeners to do because you feel like you're killing plants or you're wasting plants. Um, so in this case, you don't have to waste them. Let's say you have one of your cells where nothing came up. You pull out one. If you do it gently, you could transplant that into an empty cell. Um, but if it's just extra, just throw it away. Um, it's not worth worrying about. But when you pull it out, you want to do it gently. And the way that you do that, A, is you do it when they're pretty small. This is 
is about as big as I would like to do. You can, you can do it once bigger, but the bigger you do it, the more it's going to tear up the root system of the one you're trying to leave behind. Um, the other thing that helps a lot is have the soil be moist. So do it right after you water because they will slip right out and not pull up the roots in between. The other thing that I like to do is actually put my fingers over um, the soil. Like I'll put one finger on this side, one finger on this side, and just hold that in place. And it kind of just holds the soil in place. So when you pull out the thing, you don't pull out a big chunk of soil and the other plant with it. Um, so that will help you do that quite a bit. And then for fertilizing, you know, um, the potting soil usually has a little bit of fertilizer in it. The jiffy pellets also have a little bit of fertilizer in it. That usually only lasts for a couple of weeks. So if you're growing three, four, five, six, seven weeks, you're going to need a little bit of fertilizer. So I wait until this seedling has actually fully emerged. So like if you're looking at this picture up here, this one is all the way out. Whereas like those ones that we looked at a little while ago when they were just kind of a crook neck, like the candy cane shape, they aren't fully emerged yet. So they're not ready for fertilizer. And even, um, you know, these first leaves, those are called the seed leaves. When the next set of leaves come on, that's called the true leaves. And that's when you really need to start fertilizing if you haven't done it by now. <clears throat> Probably the easiest way to do it is use a liquid fertilizer. Um, there's organic ones, there's chemical ones, um, but mix them up. And I usually do it half strength for seedlings because I don't want to over fertilize them. And also because they're not in the greenhouse where they're getting lots of sun, you can't grow quite as fast. So I use it half strength. Um, if it says like two tablespoons per gallon, I'll use one tablespoon. Whatever the, whatever the instructions say, cut it in half. So remember to use lukewarm water. It will help the fertilizer to dissolve better. Um, and generally, I'm going to do it about once a week. And that will keep your plants moving along in a nice pace so they'll be ready to move outside. And so that is um, one of the most important parts besides the light. Um, of course, it's all important, you know, watering, you know, thinning, everything is important. But this is very important, and a lot of people don't do this step right. The thing you got to think about is you're taking plants from indoors where they're under lights to outdoors where they're out to under full sun. And think about the strength of the light. Just to give you an idea, they measure light uh, by foot candles, and foot candles just kind of a it's kind of like you're measuring watts of electricity. In this case, you're measuring the intensity of the light. Um, lots of times you'll see lumens, um, and I don't know how that translated into foot candles, but foot candle is um, what they use for like how much life, light is actually hitting the, the leaf. So indoors, um, the lights, you might be getting like 100 foot candles if you're keeping them close up to the lights, maybe 200 foot candles. Um, outside, when you move to outside full sun, um, it's going to be like 6,000 foot candles, so it's much, much stronger. And so those leaves are not used to that strong, intense light. So what you want to do is gradually transition the plants from indoors from the lights to outside. And there's a little note here that says see schedule, but I think I forgot the schedule. But I'm going to give it to you basically. You're going to do this over a period of a week, uh, seven days. And what you're going to do is the first day, you're going to take your plants outside, assuming it's warm enough. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, you think it's time to put tomato plants outside and it's we have a cold snap. So assuming it's warm enough, you know, where the days are getting up to at least 60 degrees during the day. Ideally, the night temperatures would be about 50 degrees for putting outside. Um, assuming it's warm enough and you're not going to get a big snowstorm that day or something crazy. Um, so May 1st, maybe for tomato peppers, maybe it's May 10th. Last year, it was more like May 15th. It's kind of crazy. Um, put them outside, but the first day you're going to give them one hour of sunshine. The second, and then you're going to bring them back inside and put them under the lights. The second day, you're going to give them two hours of sunshine. The third day, you're going to grow to four hours of sunshine. And of course, when they're not in sunshine, they need to be under the lights. And then you go six hours, and then eight hours, and then 10 hours. You're gradually working up to where they can be out all day long. And then after that, um, 
it'll be all day long, but bring them in at night for a couple of days. So you don't need to be under the lights then. Uh, so you get the dark period. And then, you know, two or three times at night, um, if the nights aren't too cold, you're watching the night temperatures, and then you can plant them in the ground. So it could be seven to 10 days before you actually put them in the ground. But doing this gradual transition will help them a lot. Even then, sometimes you might get a little bit of browning on the leaves uh, just because the, the sunlight's a little intense, but the new leaves, as they grow out, will be used to the stronger light and they'll do fine. So um, sometimes what I tell people, if you work all day and you can't you know, do it gradually, I would say start on the weekend um, so you can you know, put them out just a little bit the first day, the second day. And then after that, you can put them out Put them out in a place where they will get full sun for half the day, but then uh, in the afternoon, maybe get shade. You know, put them on the side of the house, and once it gets to the afternoon, they'll be in the shade for a while. That's if you can't do it gradually, you know, one hour, two hour, four hour, six hour type thing. Because um, that, that shade um, is still a lot stronger than the uh, lights indoors, but it's not as strong as the full sun. So that way, it, they'll not get too much right at once. So. Just a little bit about um, Kansas City Community Gardens, um, if you're not familiar with us or if you're not from here. Um, we're a not-for-profit agency located in Kansas City, Missouri. Our mission is to help low-income families and community groups to grow food from gardens, and we do that um, at community gardens. We help individuals. Uh, we have community orchards, our Give and Grow program. We have schools that we help, our Schoolyard Gardens program. So if you're interested in any of those programs, look at our website for more information. Um, and if you're interested in buying seeds from us, you can come into the office and become a member. We're a membership organization. Even if you're not a low-income family, you can join and become a member. It's just going to cost you a little more than a low-income family, but you'll still save quite a bit. Um, if you're not from the Kansas City area or it's hard to get here, you can actually order seeds from us online. We have a website called beanstalkseeds.com and you'll see all the different kinds of seeds and we'll actually, just like you order from any of the mail order catalog, we'll ship them right to you and um, we'll get them to you pretty fast in time for planting. Um, so um, if you do buy seeds from us and support us, that helps support school gardens, community gardens, gardens for low income people and community orchards. So um, Tell your friends, especially if you're not from around here, tell your friends all over the country to order their seeds from Kansas City Community Gardens through that beanstalkseeds.com. Um, so now I'm gonna take questions and see if Rob has any um, questions from people. Hang on while I check the line here. Yeah, I went ahead and sent you an email and Ben, if you wanna stop sharing your screen, I'll show uh, some people the website. <clears throat> okay, yeah, great. Thanks. Real quick. Yep. Okay. So uh, first off, sorry for the technical difficulties earlier. Um, I guess people had to re-register at some point. I'll look into the issue there. So I apologize, that was my fault. Um, but anyway, um, this recording, if some of you are joined late, this recording will be on our website here, kccg.org. You go to our resources, this drop down menu, how to videos, and then down here at the virtual workshops. This has um, all the workshops that we'll be doing this year. And I'm even leaving up all the ones that we did last year that were all virtual Zoom workshops. It takes a second to load here because they're YouTube clips. You can also go to our YouTube channel too if you're a YouTuber, but yeah, right here. So we did the selecting and planting fruit trees last week. Um, and so, yeah, uh, you see all of our workshops from our workshop link, but all these, all the workshops that we have scheduled will be on this virtual workshop page, so. Okay. Yeah, definitely check out our website. We have a great website um, and there's just lots of useful information there. There's so many um, videos, uh, short videos and videos like from this workshop will be available later. Um, and you can go look at ones in the past. If you want to learn about, you know, tomato plants, watch it now instead of waiting for it to come again. Uh, 
lots of good options there. So I, I'm going to answer the questions now. I'm just standing here and I see some really great questions. So I really appreciate this. Uh, the first one, somebody just asking for thoughts on the various LEDs, you know, types of light bulbs, uh, the different, sometimes they call them different temps, different color spectrum, et cetera. And it seems very complicated. Uh, and person says, maybe I just haven't learned what the benefits are. So yes, they talk about the spectrum of light, you know, how light breaks up into different colors, like the blue, green, uh, the yellow, orange, red, different, you know, parts of the, the light spectrum, you know, like when the rainbow. Um, and they used to tell us that the, the wide has all the colors was the most important. Uh, and that's true for overall plant growth, but not for starting seedlings. Um, so that's why when they, you know, first started telling people use fluorescent lights, they had these special grow light bulbs that were really expensive because they had the whole spectrum on there. But really just the regular cheapest, you know, fluorescent light bulb have the, the blue green uh, part of the spectrum, which is the most important part for seedlings. Because you're not actually trying to get a tomato fruit to grow. You're not getting it to flower. That's where you need more of the red and orange um, part of the spectrum but just the blue green part is for making the green leaves grow. So I tell people not to worry about the color spectrum, just get the cheapest bulbs. If you're using the T5 fluorescents or if you're using the LEDs, just get the regular ones. You don't need special wide spectrum bulbs for that. So um, the next question was about, um, Uh, soil blocks. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's a, another type of growing thing. It's basically where you, you you mix up some potting soil and you have this little sort of like a mold and you press on it and it sort of shapes it into a block so it doesn't have any sides at all. And, and soil blocks work great. Um, I don't use them because they're pretty time consuming. Um, but if you want to make your own soil blocks, you can do that. You basically just buy a soil blocking device a company that would have them would be like Johnny's uh, Selected Seeds. It's a seed catalog that has a lot of growing supplies. Uh, but if you just um, look online for soil blockers, you can find those and they come in different sizes. Um, you have to watch them so when they dry out, they can dry out pretty easy. Um, and, you know, and you can't handle them very much until it's time to plant them. But they, they do work well. And a lot of growers use them. Um, okay, the Jiffy pellets, uh, the question was, do you put them in an open flat? It says, when I see them, they're sold in cell packs, which seems like they could still get bound. Yes. Um, so I just put them in an open tray. Um, and um, I actually will use, I'll put them in some kind of container that doesn't have holes in it. Like I'll use like a, a foil roasting pan or something or I'll use a baking pan from the kitchen, a glass baking pan, and just put them in there and let them soak up the water. And then I'll put them in the tray that has um, holes in it. And so that when you water that tray, the excess water will go out. And um, I'll put them pretty close to each other. And then once they start growing, I'll space them out a little bit just so they aren't packed too tight so they don't start growing into each other. Uh, but still, they, they don't get root bound uh, in that kind of situation. The other question is about when you're using the Jiffy pellets, you need to tear off the bottom. No, you do not. Now, let me make a distinction. There is something called a Jiffy pot, which is not the Jiffy pellet. A Jiffy pot is uh, generally they're square or round, but it's actually made out of peat moss to a container that you have to put potting soil in. That's different. Um, if you're going to use a jiffy pot when you plant it, I do recommend tearing off the bottom and tearing off the sides. Um, the jiffy pellet, you don't have to tear off the bottom or the sides. You're just planting that whole thing uh, in the ground. So it's really easy. Um, someone asked also about the jiffy pellet. Is it better to leave the plastic cup cover off? Um, are there some plants who want to have the cover on. Okay, so I don't know, again, if they're talking about a Jiffy pellet, you have to keep the little plastic netting on. If you're talking about 
um, the little greenhouse dome, the clear plastic dome you put over your flat, um, is it better to leave that on? I would say not, because um, it's just going to get too humid under there. And um, also, it's just hard to get the lights close enough with the, with the little plastic dome. We always take ours off. Um, and I think your plants will do better. Um, you just need to make sure you keep them well watered. Um, all right, the next question was, so why do we moisten the potting mix, but then when we're covering the seeds, we put dry potting soil on top? Um, that's only just because it's easier to handle. Um, the moist potting mix, it sticks together, and so it's too easy to drop too big of a clump and bury your seeds too deeply. Um, it's fairly easy to take. Um, so you have the moist potting soil, you drop the seeds on top of the moist potting soil, and then you mist that on top of that so the seeds are moist. Then you take a little tiny bit of dry potting soil and sprinkle that over the top. That's just so when you're covering that. Um, so you're not putting too much because you can sprinkle it real easily because it's dry in between your fingers. And then you're going to take your mister and mist on top of that so it will end up being moist. So the whole thing will be moist when you're done. But just sprinkling the dry works out good. And I would just recommend that to you even if you're planting outside. Um, if you're planting tiny seeds like carrot seeds or something or collard greens or whatever, arugula, even lettuce. Um, you make a little trench out in your garden, sprinkle your seeds, and sprinkle a little tiny bit of potting soil over the top. Just because it's so lightweight, but it stays moist longer, uh, it just makes it easy for your seeds to sprout, as opposed to trying to cover them up with heavy dirt. Um, question, a couple of recommendations for what kind of fertilizer to use. Again, you're going to want to use a liquid fertilizer. <laughs> so your choices are going to be either chemical or organic. Uh, chemical is easier to find. You'll find products like Miracle Grow. Um, there's different ones uh, that you just basically, usually like a green blue powder. You mix it, you know, in a watering can. Uh, you can mix up a quart at a time or something if you want. You don't want very much. Again, use hot water. The chemical ones work okay. Um, the they're they're cheaper. And they'll be okay. It's not the same as using like chemical pesticides. Um, the um, the organic ones work great too, of course. Uh, they're just more expensive and harder to find. It's hard to find a good organic fertilizer. Lots of times you find one at the garden center, and you'll find out even though it says it has some organic stuff in it, it also has some chemical. Um, but a brand name for that would be there's a variety um, that I've seen called Age Old Grow. Um, which is a good one, and it's, it's, it's an organic liquid fertilizer. Um, might have to order it online. Um, again, that's called Age Old Grow. There's other ones. If you go to um, any garden center, but make sure that it's 100% organic if you want to use an organic fertilizer, um, and, and just make sure the ingredients, and I would look for something that says that it's certified organic, because that would mean that it's actually a true organic product. So, um, again, that's usually a little bit harder to find those. And then the last question was, <clears throat> excuse me, is there a certain time of day that's better to begin putting the plants out? And I would say yes. I would put them out in the afternoon um, because it's going to be a little warmer. Again, you're thinking it's early May. In the morning, it might be kind of cold. Um, and then, um, you know, in the, you know, by the time you get to afternoon, it'll be a little bit warmer, and you're only going to put them out for an hour the first day, and then a couple hours the second day. Eventually, you'll be putting them out in the morning. You'll be able to take a little bit cooler apart. So if, if in that process of putting them out, the temperatures change, and suddenly it gets really, really cold, it's going to be down in the 30s, the 40s. I would just bring your plants indoors, keep them under the lights. You'll have to kind of start the process over a little bit um, to get them gradually used to the outside. But just again, be careful um, putting them out, do it gradually. Um, I saw in the chat just a question, somebody's asking about fish emulsion as a fertilizer. Fish emulsion is a great organic fertilizer. The problem is indoors, fish emulsion smells terrible. So it might not be something you'd want to use in your house. In your basement, it'd probably be fine, uh, but I would go easy on it until you're sure that you can handle that smell your house. Um, 
So some of the other organic fertilizers, there's some of their seaweed based. Uh, they're not quite as smelly, but some of them still have a little bit of fragrance to them. So again, you might want to check that out a little bit before you start doing it in the house. Um, so if you have more questions, you can email us at contact at kccg.org. Uh, if you have more questions, thank you for joining us. Uh, check the website for upcoming workshops. And if you haven't ever been here, come and visit us. If you have never been here, come visit us for sure in the summer and our beanstalk children's garden. All right. Thanks, everybody.